While in San Francisco, Wilder picked up an assignment for the ruralist. She wrote a cover story for the newspaper about the Panama Pacific Exposition in its December 5th edition that year. Also while in San Francisco, Wilder published a handful of children's poems in the bulletin in a column called The Tuckamin Quarter. The poems themselves aren't that remarkable, but they marked a turning point in Wilder's career. For the first time, she used the byline, Laura Ingalls Wilder. In many respects, this trip to San Francisco was very successful, both professionally and personally for Wilder. But after observing her daughter's work ethic, drive, and professional ambition up close, Wilder wasn't sure that writing for the big markets was what she wanted. Wilder wrote home to Almanzo that, the more I see of how Rose works, the better satisfied I am to raise chickens. I intend to do some writing that will count, but I would not be driven by the work as she is for anything, and I do not see how she can stand it. Just one more point about this visit. Wilder also observed that her daughter didn't stick to the facts, even when she wrote what readers believed to be nonfiction. Remember that biography about Jack London, which Lane published for Sunset, the fictionalized biography? Even in 1915, when Lane was working for the San Francisco Bulletin, a cub reporter, so to speak, she was fictionalizing her newspaper stories. In a letter home to Almanzo, Wilder described their daughter's creative approach to one of her recent columns. Instead of being an old detective, he, Edmund Rowe, is an old crook who has served time more than once. The column in question was Edmund Rowe, Manhunter. It was supposed to be an interesting profile about an interesting San Franciscan, but Lane invented the subject's name, occupation, and his situation. That same year, with her mother's help, Lane authored, or actually ghost wrote, what ran in the San Francisco Bulletin as an autobiography about a railroad engineer working in Dakota Territory. The title of the piece was Behind the Headlight. According to Wilder, Lane had interviewed an engineer for the piece and had used some of his ideas in this autobiography. But Lane also used information she'd gleaned from her mother, multiple sources distilled into one voice and one fictional character, masquerading as nonfiction. Nevertheless, Wilder wrote home to Almanzo that every incident in the story is true. Clearly, Wilder approved of her daughter's approach. Keep these episodes in mind when we talk about autobiography and Pioneer Girl later and throughout the semester as we examine the Little House novels themselves. Are they autobiography or historical fiction? In the years that followed, Wilder continued to trust Lane's editorial instincts again and again. Although the two of them had been professional writers for about the same length of time, and regardless of the manner and tone in which the advice was delivered, Lane became the expert, Wilder became her student. Most of Lane's editorial advice to her mother was solid, basic, and essential. The kind of advice students today often hear in creative writing classes. Here, for example, don't say those things were so, show that they were so. Your log cabin in the great woods, your trip through Kansas, the building of the railroad through the Dakotas. Make it all real because you saw it with your own eyes. Make the reader see it with his eyes. In other words, show, don't tell. And yes, the date is correct. Apparently, Wilder was thinking about a long-form autobiographical work as early as 1919. Throughout the late teens, the 1920s, and into the 1930s, Lane continued to provide editorial advice to her mother. She moved Wilder into what they both called 
the big markets. Wilder wrote and sold three magazine articles under Lane's heavy-handed editorial direction, one to McCall's and the other two to the country gentlemen, major national magazines of the period. Although Wilder took her daughter's advice to heart, it wasn't always easy. Lane was often condescending. Now, dearest Mama Bess, she wrote, don't get excited and rattled about this. If you'll just calmly do as I tell you, you will see that my predictions come out in the end, however fantastic they sound to you. And Lane's tone was often blunt, brutally honest, and full of self-confidence. You don't know how to write stuff for country gentlemen. You never will know until you stop and listen to what I tell you. Wilder apparently sometimes found her daughter's aggressive editorial approach hard to take, especially when Lane jumped in and rewrote whole chunks of text. Wilder's letters to Rose from this period don't survive, but judging from Lane's replies to them, Wilder sometimes felt wounded, discouraged, and dismayed. Don't be absurd about my doing the work on your article, Lane wrote her mother. I didn't rewrite it a bit more than I rewrite Mary Heaton Vorse's articles or Inez Haynes Irwin stories. And this letter from 1924. I'm sorry that, as you say, knowing it was my work that sold takes some of the joy out of it. It wasn't really my work. Please don't run off with that idea. Yet this is the relationship that continued into 1930. By then, Wilder had stopped writing for the ruralist, and Lane, as we've discussed, had become something of a literary celebrity. This writer-editor relationship, fraught with emotion, tension, and talent, would carry both women forward into Wilder's next creative experiment, Pioneer Girl, her first book-length project, an autobiographical account of her childhood and adolescence for adults.